This is a Nexus special, episode 65, WWDC 19, on June 3rd, 2019. And now, conclusion, insufficient occlusion. This Nexus special is hosted by Brandon Johnson and Brian Mitchell. Find the show notes for this episode at thenexus.tv slash ns65. Wow, Brian, that was some great title music. Ah, oh, truly awe-inspiring. It's wonderful. You know what that uh, that great title music reminded me of? Uh, I don't know. Uh, something about cheese. Yeah, we well, yeah, we haven't like had a cheese grater made by Apple since what late twenty or late twenty thirteen. Twenty thirteen. Twenty thirteen. Well, yeah, yeah, last last updated their cheese grater in twenty ten, but oh we haven't been able to buy one since twenty thirteen when the trash can came out to replace the cheese grater. Jeez. All right, listener. That means we have a new Mac Pro in the house. I just gotta say, this thing looks incredible. It's, it really does. It's got uh, these stainless steel. Uh, they call it the space frame, and so it's a you know some like I don't know, quarter inch, third inch, half inch thick steel rod that's bent to form four legs and that comes up and forms handles. And then there's like an aluminum kind of box thing around it, but it's like a three dimensional spherical cheese grater kind of shape. It looks like an espresso machine, and I kind of want to buy one to put it next to my espresso machine. <laughs> it would fit right in. And so they call this the latticed aluminum housing, and I'll read a little quote from their website. Um, it says, uh, design inspired by nature. The lattice pattern on Mac Pro is based on a naturally occurring phenomenon in molecular crystal structures. In a work of three-dimensional interlocking hemispheres, uh, it increases the surface area, optimizing airflow and structural rigidity. It looks sweet. Fancy you should, looking. You should check it out. Yeah. Um, this thing is powerful. Um, it's got 28 cores. It runs continuously at maximum load, uh, so no throttling and stuff. Uh, it has up to a terabyte and a half of RAM in uh, 12 DIMM slots, so it's like six channels uh, or six pairs. It's ECC DDR4 RAM. Uh, it has eight PCIe slots, but... Also, two new MPX slots, which stands for Mac Pro Expansion Module. Um, this is like a custom thing that builds on top of PCIe, but it supplies, I think, 500 watts of power for each kind of module itself. That's which absurd. they say is more power than the than the last generation Mac Pro had total. Wow. Um, so each module can hold up to two GPUs. Um, and so if you have the... Uh, Radeon Pro Vega 2 Duo, which is the uh, highest-end graphics card that you can put in there. It can drive mm-hmm. up to 12 4K displays or six uh, Pro Display XDRs. That's Apple's new display, which we'll get to in a few minutes. So this thing drives so many pixels. It's mind-boggling. Um, so they have uh, MPX graphics cards that have a single GPU um, or two GPUs in them. And then you can run you know, up to two MPX. So you could run four of these Radeon Pro Vega 2s, which are insane graphics cards. Yeah, it's it's pretty wild. I'm remembering back to when I was working on an installation, uh, like an interactive installation, where we were basically building computers not unlike um, this Mac Pro. Um, and, you know, I, f- I feel like uh, given the chance to do that over again, basically this configuration is almost exactly what, we, what we'd be looking for. We wouldn't have to build it custom. Oh, that'd be fantastic. Pretty wild. Um, yeah, so part, also part of the reason they built these MPX modules is you can link two graphics cards together at a much higher bandwidth for them to communicate with each other. Um, it looks like each card is kind of Apple... Apple design with these, you know, AMD Radeon Pro Vegas or other AMD graphics card chips on them. So mm-hmm. Apple kind of like took the base thing and then built their own graphics card. Um, the MPX card also allows you to integrate Thunderbolt into the graphics card. Um, in addition to that power, hmm. uh, they also have an, a card called Afterburner, which lets you um, compute ProRes and ProRes RAW video streams. So if it was something like. 12 4K streams at 30 frames per second and three 8K streams at 30 frames per second. So it'll offload a lot of work from your graphics cards um, so they can do other things and then have the afterburner just compute the video. Um, in Apple fashion from the last couple of years, it is secured to the T2 chip, which is basically a watch OS in your computer that handles 
uh, disk encryption, including the, the controller for the f- up to four terabyte solid state. Um, something else impressive, just the, the power supply for this thing is up is, I think, 1.4 kilowatt power supply. I don't know how much the old cheese grater max used. They used a lot, but this is a lot again. Yeah, 1.4 kilowatt seems like almost a dangerous amount of power to be <laughs> to be putting into such a small package. <laughs> it's like three it's like three relatively large and beefy desktop power supplies in one basically. Yeah. Uh like you know a, a house a house in the US here that's you know built in the last I don't know 100 year maybe 100 you know new houses have 20 watt circuits usually but the older ones yeah. have 15 or 15 amp circuits and those only let you drive 100 or 1800 watts so you have a mac pro and you only have 400 watts to spare which might not be enough to drive your display or displays and speakers and like anything else you have plugged in so you could need to like have a separate circuit in your house for the mac pro that's hilarious um, it has three large fans in the front, so similar to the classic cheese grater Mac Pro. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know how many fans they had. That was a long time ago. And then kind of one blower fan towards the back. Um, so the three suck air in, and the blower kind of pulls that air across the memory to cool it down. Um, nice. Now what this means is you have large fans that run at a low RPM, so it's a lot quieter. And then um, it eliminates the need for fans on individual components. So the heat sinks in there are a bit larger but it means it's a lot quieter. Nice. In the meantime, it'll heat your house. Exactly. You're, uh, you have a 1.4 kilowatt power supply for something. Yeah, exactly. You can get wheels on this, so you can easily move it around from like studio to studio or something. Yeah. Uh, I checked the weight. It says 39.7 pounds. <laughs> this might weigh a lot more with more graphics cards. I'm not sure. For so real. Heavy. That's yeah. ridiculous. And it'll ship in fall of 2019. Just a couple more months. Yeah. So they also announced this new display, which is called Pro Display XDR. It has the same lattice aluminum in the back. Um, their little promo video on YouTube, which I think they aired in the keynote, said it will act as a heatsink as well. Uh, it has 20 million pixels. It's a 6K display. has that P3 color gamut and 10-bit color. Um, the, the backlight system sounds new. So the XDR, I should say, stands for... Uh, extreme extreme dynamic range i think yep so i think part of that is the backlighting system so it's 576 blue leds that kind of create a dynamic backlight so a lot of large tvs nowadays have been doing something like this where they have backlight zones so i know at least my tcl tv i can see when it's dark you know there's like text that comes up at the end of a show or a movie you know it's just in the lower third or something you can see a little square where the backlight is on and the rest is all black because there's no text there or anything. So the backlight doesn't need to be on. And so this is the mm-hmm. same thing, but only through 576 LEDs. So it's much more fine grain than like the 75 my TV has. Mm-hmm. Uh, it brings you a million to one contrast ratio. Um, also, this display is super bright for a big display like this. It's a thousand nits on full screen sustained and uh, 1600 nits at peak. Uh, there's a little asterisk on the site so i looked that up looked that up and it said when it's less than 25 degrees celsius so Hmm. i wonder if these leds are overheating you know you know because when they get hotter they're less efficient so they probably get a little dimmer for sure um and better off access contrast than the standard monitor i wonder if they're comparing against ips displays or not so this just means if you're looking at it from the non like optimal viewing angle are your colors going to look right yeah, one of the most interesting things about this is when they were announcing uh, when they were announcing it, I was in a Slack conversation with some folks about or we were guessing how much it was going to cost. And, um, you know, when one of the things that was kind of intriguing about the way that Apple was describing it was they kept going back to this idea of like a forty three thousand dollar reference monitor, which like, yeah, reference monitors that are made to be calibrated perfectly um, to preview print things and stuff like that. Those cost a ridiculous amount of money. Um, and you know, what Apple's really built here is super impressive, but it's kind of wacky to, to, uh, compare it to something that, you know, really ultimately a very small number of people will ever have any context for, uh, which will become important shortly as we start talking price for this stuff. Yeah. I like this display sounds awesome, but 
I, I, I'm only hoping that it will go down in price in the next couple of years as mm-hmm. computers get more powerful to drive a 6K display and more people are making 6K displays. So you just have to lower the price to make it more competitive. Mm-hmm. Um, it comes with a stand optionally or a vase mount, and it looks like it's connected with a, a magnet. And that's mount lets you raise and lower it a whole bunch and adjust the viewing angles, but also rotate it to be vertical if you want. So that's pretty neat. Yeah, I would almost buy the stand before I'd buy the monitor itself. <laughs> um. So uh, how much does that monitor cost, or the Mac Pro? Uh, I think they they both are estimated to start at $6,000. Uh, with the monitor, though, you can get the monitor for $5,000 without the stand, but where you are going to mount this thing? It's a beast. Yeah. I heard that in the keynote when they mentioned the stand was $1,000 that the audience laughed. Yeah, they they people were audibly groaning, and it was very odd. They could not move away from that slide quickly enough. Wow. I wonder if it'll come down in price soon, or even if before release. But we'll Yeah, see. I'd have to imagine this thing doesn't last very long as a product. Yeah, we'll see. They could probably make like 10,000 of them and, and be done. Yep. And half of them will go to Apple stores as demo units. <laughs> right. Exactly. Jeez. Uh, Want to talk software? Yeah, let's do it. So I, I started out building these show notes just from looking on YouTube. So I'll just uh, tell everyone here, I didn't watch the keynote. I had a busy day at work. I haven't even caught up on Twitter. I've, I'm on Twitter. I've caught up through during the keynote up until they started the Mac OS section. So I have like hundreds and hundreds of tweets to read still. We'll see if I get through it or not. But... Um, Going off their YouTube, another video they had, um, in addition to the Mac Pro stuff, was Memoji enhancements. And so they just were mentioning some new features that you could add to your Memojis. So things like eyeshadow, lipstick, piercings, teeth, even a mini grill, uh, earrings, hats, glasses, and AirPods. Of course. So that'll be fun. And we'll talk more features about that when we get to the iOS section. But before that, let's talk tvOS. Um... I couldn't find a section on what's new in tvOS on Apple's website, and I didn't watch the keynote, but the two things I got from tweets are it supports the Xbox One X and DualShock 4 controllers in the operating system, so you can play games with that. And I I think the crowd is pretty happy about that. And their new screensavers. Yeah. Uh, I remember seeing a little bit about this in the... uh, I kind of tuned in for the first part of the keynote, left for a meeting, and then came back for the macOS part, so I think... Our uh, our perception of, of what happened is probably somewhat complimentary. Um, but as far as the tvOS stuff went, I feel like for the most part, um, you know, we're going to see a lot of changes when Apple TV Plus, their subscription service, rolls out in the fall. And that was kind of all that was teased, I feel like. A bunch of new content, but um, not a ton on the software side for tvOS. Yeah, I feel like the operating system is good enough for what they want to do with it. Um you know, the people haven't really hopped on the tvOS bandwagon for games and things. So mm-hmm. more support, more controller support sounds good. And can I watch media? Yes. Great. I'm happy with tvOS. Sounds kind of my opinion. More screensavers. That's pretty sweet. Honestly, that's probably one of the coolest things that they could add to the operating system that would actually be impactful to me, which is completely ridiculous. But still, it's true. Yeah. Sometimes you get tired of looking at that same stretch of L.A. from time to time. Exactly. And I missed some of the original screensavers that they never made in 4K. So right. I haven't seen them in a while. I need new ones. All right. Next up, watchOS. Now, this is something we both have uh, experience with, at least using watchOS. I had the Series 0 Apple Watch. Now I have the Series 3 with cellular, but I canceled cellular because I don't need that. Um, and you have what Apple Watch? I think I have the Series 3 as well. Um, and I also had a Series Zero. I'm pretty sure we're on the same Apple Watch schedule, which right. I think would mean that when the Series Five comes out later this year, it might be time to upgrade. <laughs> you know it. I'll see you there. Yep. Um, so there are a bunch of new improvements to WatchOS, and they all look pretty solid. Um, so to begin with, there are some new watch faces. Um, I didn't find like a great list of exactly what all the faces are, but. New faces, um, some new kind of complications you can bring in are things like the current decibel level of the area you're in, 
um, cellular strength, uh, chance of rain, um, and it, you can have your watch tap or chime you on the hour, um, or you can hold like two fingers on the watch face to hear the time spoken aloud. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, I'm excited for new watch faces. I feel like I've used the, I've used the modular one basically the whole time, but mm-hmm. I wish I could customize the complications even more. I think a yeah. larger watch might help too. That has some of the the series four had those fancy new complication styles, and I think you could fit a little more in because the screen is a little bit larger and has the more the rounded corners, so they kind of squeeze more in there. Totally. All right. Um, you can ask Siri what song is this, and it'll use um, Shazam and Siri together. Um, Apple bought Shazam like a year ago or something. I think. Mm-hmm. I think it was about a year ago. So yep. that's now internal to them. That's a feature I use all the time on iOS. And uh, when when my watch fails to do it effectively, it, it's always kind of a bummer because especially if you're trying to frantically catch like the tail end of a song, uh, when you say it to your watch, thinking your watch will, will help you out uh, and it messes it up, um, you know, it's kind of a bummer. Yeah. I mostly use Shazam when I'm at like EDM shows, so it's way mm-hmm. too loud for me to me to be able to speak to Siri and have it even understand what I'm saying. Right. But so I use the Shazam app a lot, but not so much through my voice. Um, okay, there are previews of web results uh, when you ask Siri a question. So oftentimes you ask Siri, uh, "Hey, what's this thing?" and Siri doesn't know, so it says, "I found this on the web." On the watch, you can now see some of the previews of the top results. So it may or may nice. not answer your question, but it will show a little more than saying, I found results on the web. Would you like to use your iPhone to show the results? And <laughs> it's like, no, I'm on my watch. I don't want to. Yep. So I think that'll at least help with frustration. Hopefully so. Um, I don't know if it's – or uh, first of all, there's now the App Store on the Apple Watch. So apps can run independent of an iPhone, and you can download apps without having to use the app on the phone as well. Hmm. Um. I think they added – so with the cellular watch last year – or no, with Series 3, they added this, you know, the ability for apps to be more independent. So you could you know, use an app to check something when you're on a run and your phone's at home. Mm-hmm. But you know, now the app store on the watch is kind of completing that. And so you can now use an app without even needing the iPhone. And so they're completely independent. They have to do more now because you, know, you can't depend on like syncing to your phone when you get back or anything. Yeah. So that'll be exciting to see. Um, I don't know if it's a new app or what, but there's um, audiobook support on the Apple Watch. Yeah. Uh, there's now a calculator. There's a voice memos app. Um, I think there are new complications that let you like resume an audiobook just by tapping on the complication and start a voice memo just by tapping on the compliment, uh, tapping on it. Um, they redesigned the reminders app. You can now send an emoji or memoji stickers. Uh, And now there's a bunch of health improvements, too. So there are now activity trends. So this will show you things like over time, your walking pace, your flights climbed, your VO2 max, as well as your exercise move, stand minutes, um, stand time, and distance, um, kind of at a 90 and 365 day average. Nice. Yeah, the pulse oximetry stuff is something like that's a thing that, uh, especially in the past year or so, has become like increasingly important to me. Uh, so like, it's, it's cool to see Apple kind of getting more finer grained with that. Um, because that's just gonna, um, just gonna increase kind of the stickiness of the watch as a product. Um, and, uh, you know, it's kind of cool to see that maturation over time for sure. Yeah. I'm really excited to see this. It's, you know, it's super personal data. Like it's just data about myself that it's, you know, always recording. And so I know it's kind of there, but. Now I get to visualize it and see how it changes because I'd be very interested to see how things compare over time, you know, what time of the year or this year versus the year before when I was living in a different place, you know, yeah. more so than just like this month versus the other month. Because, you know, from year to year, I might be traveling one month, one year and not traveling that same month, another year. And mm-hmm. so it totally throws everything off. And so just being able to get some more smoothed out averages of all that. I'm really excited about. Nice. Um, there's now cycle tracking. So um, 
for menstruation cycles. So you can um, measure things like the flow, enter symptoms such as headaches or cramps, um, cycle length or variation, as well as get alerts about your uh, fertile window. Um, and Apple does note that it should not be used for birth control. That's good. Science is good. I'm glad. I'm glad they did that. I, I, like the big thing is that like a lot of these, a lot of apps that purport to offer this kind of thing are often lampooned on Twitter and, 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 um, just, just because like sometimes they can be awfully obtuse and, you know, hopefully Apple didn't fuck it up. <laughs> Frankly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Only time. And I tell. think they're notorious, you know, because Apple now has, uh, it built in and there's an app mm-hmm. on the Apple watch to record all this. It's, I think it's going to be much more secure and private than the app store. Totally. I, pretty much just use Apple's stuff for all my activity and health stuff because A, it's easier and B, it's, I know it's secure and private. Um, I do trust like Strava, but that's, I think the only third party one I use right now. Yep. I'm with you. Uh, there's hearing health section. And so I think your watch will always be kind of listening for the audio level around you and it'll send you an alert when you're at a certain decibel range. Um, I saw a screenshot saying something like the, um, environment you're in is at over 90 decibels and so exposure to this for more than 20 minutes could result in temporary hearing loss and so that's kind of nice i think i think (laughs) that'll push a lot more 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 people to be conscious of the environments they're in and to maybe wear earplugs and i just am scared to wear this to a a show or a festival or something because it's loud i was gonna say what's what's that gonna say you're gonna have to try it out at the next show at the skyway or something like that yeah (laughs) yeah hopefully not over 100 (laughs) <laughs> but who knows yeah uh there's a new native ui framework which i think brandon will talk about later because i don't know anything about it oh um, so this is this is the swift ui thing maybe i don't know they just apple mentioned new ui framework and so i put it in the notes gotcha. but if um if that is what it is we can talk about that later with the other Truly stuff that indeed. i don't know about and then you listener can hear about me learning about mac things the first time ever it'll be great um, a few other developer things. Um, so, yeah, again, apps can be independent. Um, there's sign-in with Apple, which is a new thing we'll talk about in iOS. Um, you can now stream audio. Uh, there's extended runtime for applications, and I think something about you know being backgrounded and waking up again. Um, and you can access the Neural Engine and Core ML. Nice. And um, WatchOS 6 will work on the Apple Watch Series 1 or newer. Awesome. Yeah, that seems like a pretty solid upgrade. I'm excited. All right, next up, iOS. So this is by far our largest section. Um, So we'll try to get through it pretty quick here. Um, The biggest feature that I bet most people are going to notice is there's now a dark mode. Hooray, dark mode. So tvOS has had this for a few years, and there's been hints to it in, uh, I think, iOS over the last couple of years, including macOS, but macOS got it last year. Um, And due to things like Project Marzipan, where... You can run Mac OS apps, or no, iOS apps on the Mac, I think, right? I don't know. I didn't watch that section. The Mac supports dark mode, so probably iOS should as well. There's some photos and camera improvements. Um, you can do portrait lighting control in a, in a um, photo you've already taken, or maybe real time. I'm not exactly sure. Um, there's a high key mono for a portrait mode um, black and white photo. Um, they kind of redesigned the photos tab in the photos app. Um, so it's kind of a curated view of the best moments from either your day, your month, or your year. Um, they kind of redesigned the uh, editing screen so you can, you know, you can apply certain filters and it shows how strongly those filters are applied. So for things like brightness changes and saturation and any of that good stuff. And you can do video editing. So things like rotating, cropping, and auto enhancing. Just being able to rotate a video on your phone is awesome because... Totally. I've definitely recorded videos that I'm like pulling my phone out really fast and it's still in portrait mode when I start recording the video, though I'm holding it horizontally the whole time. And so then that video is saved as a, as a vertical video, but it's actually portrait or wait, that's the same portrait video. That's actually horizontal or landscape. So yeah, that'll be nice. Uh, Maps. There's a new map that shows more details around you. So things like beaches, buildings, roads, parks, and more. And there's basically Apple's Street View. I don't know what their marketing term for this is or anything, but... I think um, they call it like Live View live view or something, but 
I can't remember off the top of my head. Okay. Yeah, I'm sure we'll hear more about that. But I've been seeing photos on Twitter over the last, like, two or three or four years of vans with Apple Maps, like, stickers on them with a bunch of cameras on their roofs. So they've been going around the country and the world for a couple of years now taking photos. Uh, You can do um, favorites in Maps. So I think some of that's, like, series suggestions, but, you know, recently used that kind of stuff. Um, as well as collections, so you can save things for later and then share collections with others as well. All right, Siri, there's a new voice. It sounds really good. Um, Apple says especially for longer uh, sentences and and strings of text, it should sound better. Um, Siri is now more conversational with shortcuts. I don't know exactly what this means. Hopefully variable support, though that's totally just me going off of what I would like to see in there. Um, it can now learn voices of family members on the HomePod, um, and it can announce messages on AirPods. So things like read the message when you get a text message, um, and you can pair up to two sets of AirPods to one phone at the same time. So you can listen to something with a friend and, um, you can, I saw there's a new API or something to play media from named apps. So saying like, play this on this music service and then you can also use some of that to add it to your uh, music library or a playlist nice those are two of the biggest pain point pain points i feel like for airpods right now for for bluetooth headphones of any sort in particular but i think it'll be particularly helpful on airpods um like i know folks who use spotify who are always really upset about not being able to control spotify in the same way you're able to control apple music um, and I just use Apple Music. That's my resolution for it. But uh, yeah, I've already been able to do all this with Apple Music. Yeah. But yeah, you know, it'll be nice. Uh, messages. So all the m- emoji stuff we talked about earlier, but mm-hmm. um, emoji are now uh, added as a sticker pack that can be used on in messages, mail, and other third party applications. So this sounds like you can also use sticker packs and more apps than just messages. I guess pretty wild um you can also share your name and a photo in messages um the keyboard has some improvements like quick path typing so you can swipe around the stock apple keyboard similar to all those swipe apps that came up around ios 8 when you could do third-party keyboards so mm-hmm. now it's first party and i think it it learns through you know on device machine learning about your swiping patterns I'm excited about that one because I've tried a few swipe apps over the years, but the third-party keyboards are never given as much priority as the Apple one in terms of loading speed and you know mm-hmm. responsiveness. I think the Apple one's probably all, always or almost always in memory, where the third-party ones have to kind of load up every so often. That's definitely one of the things. I feel like that third-party keyboard or keyboard extension feature is like one of those things that everybody was asking for back in the iOS 8, iOS 9 days. And ever since then, like everyone's found better ways to do that, to accomplish that same thing without using a keyboard extension. And like, I remember 1Password had a keyboard extension for a long time. And then they when- did? the pa- I never yeah. even used it. Wow. Oh yeah, yeah. But nobody ever, wa- like the uh, improved like share, share sheet APIs came out around the same time. And they were like, oh, well, we'll just use this, and that'll be our way in. Yeah, um, because the the keyboard APIs didn't bring things like autocorrect or auto capitalization or, like, anything. So you had to re-implement so much stuff just to be at the same level of where you're trying to bring customers from that right. it was just so much work. And then it worked differently. And, um, yeah, the only keyboard the app that I know that's, you know, big and people like to use is Google's Gboard. Mm-hmm. And I've tried that every so often over time, but I always go back to the Apple one because it's a little faster. It's not yep. Google and it it's just stock. So keep it simple. Yeah. Not Google will take you a long way too. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. If only DuckDuckGo made a keyboard. Right. All right. Next up we have reminders. Um, so they kind of redesigned this app. Um, there are now smart lists. There are series suggestions for reminders. So if you're, you know, uh, if you have a reminder and you're, you've called some contact out or something, and you're messaging them in the other app, it can come down with a little reminder saying, "Hey, remember to do this thing." 
Um, and there's a quick toolbar for inserting things, I think, like location and dates and whatnot. Similar to, I think, how like the Numbers app does it for certain cells in the in a spreadsheet. Nice. And next up, sign in with Apple. This seems really cool. It's basically, uh, you know how on websites and things you see sign in with Google, sign in with Twitter or GitHub or something. It's like that, but with your Apple ID. And not just your Apple ID, but Apple will mask under the hood and send a new anonymized email when you're signing up and creating a service. So mm-hmm. uh, they can't you know, use your email to, to track you across multiple services that they have access to. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think I saw in some developer guidelines that every app that supports a multi-provider single sign-on solution needs to support um, sign-in with Apple or else they could be rejected from the App Store. That is the best thing. I love, like, people kind of make fun of Apple or uh, criticize Apple for some some aspects of how controlling they are about stuff like this. But Apple, I feel like, uses that kind of thing as a force for good in some situations, and one of which is getting rid of the scourge that is, um, you know, social login. <laughs> um, so, good, good for them. Yeah, I'm really excited to see that, and... I so I you know I use one password and things and let me see how many accounts I have in here it's probably somewhere around like 350 different logins which is ridiculous and way too many and you know oh, yeah. using a single sign in solution like this is just oh I don't have credentials I just tap sign in with apple um I think it would let you do things like if you're on a web page and you need to sign in um it would have something on the page that would just use face id in a web browser to sign into a service. And that's Mm -hmm. sweet Then I don't have to like tap the password field and then tap the password and then use face ID. It's just there doing it for me. Mm -hmm. Pretty prime. Uh, New location controls. So the big one to me is you can, um, there's a new API that apps can use that will mean a user can allow location access once and then be prompted basically every time they're going to use location. So this sounds great for things like Facebook, where, sure, maybe I'll want to post a photo or something every so often that includes a location, but I don't want Facebook tracking me constantly when I'm not doing that posting. Mm -hmm. And so things like uh, Instagram is kind of the same way, or maybe Snapchat. uh, What are other big apps that do things like that? Any AR app ever. Google Maps. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. Or like a game or, you know, something you would like should this be using location oftentimes it might be some obscure like sharing thing or whatnot like yeah um where it makes sense in that context to have location and i would say sure have it now but after that i don't want them to still have access until i remove it explicitly later on right um home kit there's now a home kit secure video service so things like smart security cameras and I think I saw somewhere you have to have a iCloud storage plan of 200 gigabytes or more to be able to do that. Makes sense. You wouldn't want to get into a situation where you're running into the limit there. And 200 gigs is the bare minimum for storing any amount of video like that. Yeah. And I think they record up to 10 days at once or keep up to 10 days. So that could be a lot of video. For sure. I saw something on Twitter about Linux IoT HomeKit support. Hmm. I, again, haven't been on Twitter enough, but something about HomeKit and Linux working together. That's Not cool. Not sure I, after that. Yeah, I don't think I heard anything about that, but I I support it. I think it's cool. Yeah. I know uh, Steve Charton Smith, like a week ago, was tweeting about um, running Darwin, which is Apple's kernel, on Linux, and that there's a compiler target for one of the ARM uh instruction sets out there or i think someone has made it but i think apple has something deeply hidden maybe i don't know i'm sure we'll hear more about that as time comes on awesome uh carplay this is something you use i don't have carplay in my 2013 old school car um but there's a new carplay dashboard and a new calendar Uh, app and now the apple music app shows album artwork yeah i'm super excited for new carplay um CarPlay is one of those like kind of value add features that's kind of may seem kind of silly at first, but it really kind of takes, you know, uh, it takes something that like car makers put some effort into to their credit 
um, which is like their entertainment radio whatever system, uh, and kind of gives it, hands it, allows Apple to kind of take it over and um, kind of make it a really nice continuous experience from your phone. Um, and, you know, it's it's already been really awesome to have uh, CarPlay on my uh, 2018 Mazda 3. But the, the thing that gets kind of dicey about it is um, you can only really view one piece of information at a time. And given that I'm always the person driving my car, I don't really care because I'm not really looking at information. But I could see how if like certain if passengers in the car, for example, wanted to, for example, change the song or um, change or God forbid, see what song is playing and see where we are on the map at the same time. Um, that's all stuff that'll be supported by this new CarPlay dashboard. That's more truly it's more of a dashboard and less of just like a single view. Uh, and that's kind of cool. Um, I did look at um, what it would take to build a CarPlay app uh, a little while ago, and it turns out quite a bit. You have to have a really good idea because you have to actually tell Apple what kind of CarPlay app you're building before you get support to actually build a CarPlay app. You have to get a special entitlement, which is kind of a bummer. So, alas, I have not done so. Yeah, CarPlay is one of those things that has always, as as you kind of said, it was it's a value add, but you end up using it a lot, and it's it seems really nice. And there are like third party radios you can install in your car that do this, but they're mm-hmm. like five hundred dollars minimum, up to like eight or nine hundred dollars if you're doing the wireless versions. And it's just like that's is that worth it? I don't know. Bluetooth seems oh, yeah. to work so far. So if uh, if my if my car manufacturer had not um, had an offer to add CarPlay to to the system free of charge i probably wouldn't have done it for 200 bucks which was what they wanted to charge for it um i would i would have totally punted on it if i if i didn't but i'm so glad i did get it because um uh it it does make that just like the act of using the radio and navigation and getting around so much so much more pleasant definitely um apple did uh note performance uh, gains as well in this version of iOS. So in iOS 12, they kind of classic or okay, I shouldn't even say classic or famously because most people probably don't really remember this. But um, they they kind of pushed back a few features for mm-hmm. iOS 13, which I'm assuming is some of the stuff we've been seeing um, in favor of increasing performance. Uh, but they've kind of done that again a little bit. So Face ID will unlock up to 30% faster than iOS 12, um, and I think they tested it with the iPhone 10 and 10s, which Actually, yeah, those are the only devices that support Face ID or iPhones. So, great. <laughs> um, and faster app launch. So, this is up to twice as fast. Um, and apps have a smaller download size. So, installs are up to 50% smaller and updates are up to 60% smaller. Awesome. Do you have any idea why that might be? Uh, it's probably more aggressive app thinning. And it probably has to do with including the Swift binary or the Swift runtime uh, at an operating system level. Those are two things I feel like could probably have quite a bit to do with this. Um, I've heard some things about Mac OS being, uh, having the Swift runtime bundled at an OS level, and I'm imagining that same thing is true of iOS, just based on the way people are talking about it. Gotcha, because it, it is ABI stable now, so yeah, they can ship a version in the OS. Um, I saw something about um, the Dynamic Library Linker version 3, like... Mm-hmm. DYLD3 is that new or is they or has that been out a couple of years because I know that can help with um, app launch size as well or yeah launch time so the the linker when you're building like the linker in the Xcode build to, tool chain has to be like one of the most annoying obnoxious difficult things uh, that I've had to deal with and part of it is because I have no fucking clue what's going on with it um so uh, I'm probably not the best person to answer that question. Um, I will. I will say yes. That probably does have some impact on it. Um, and also, I really wish I knew more about that. So, listeners, if you know of anywhere I could learn about how dynamic linking works, particularly in iOS and Mac apps, um, I would be grateful for your links and conversation because it is a source of constant struggle for this kid. We need your links on the linker. Yeah, yep. this is and that's stuff that I've just picked up through following jailbreak developers and Apple developers for like mm-hmm. probably 
eight years now. So I see all these terms a lot. And while I'm not an iOS or Apple developer at all, I understand some of the concepts that are involved, which is very strange sometimes. But definitely not dynamic li- uh, linkers. Um, okay, also new in iOS 13 is Apple Arcade, which they mentioned in that March event. So subscription gaming. Uh, that's all I'll say about that for now. Uh, there's a new voice control feature in iOS and macOS. And this, there's a YouTube video, um, that kind of goes over it and it seems really cool. Um, so if you aren't able to like control a keyboard or a mouse, but you can still see the screen, you can use your voice to, um, ask for elements on the screen, move focus around, click buttons by their button name, um, provide little numbers next to options and say, um, so like in photos app, they had some photos there and, um, the, the man said something about, you know, show options. And then he said, okay, 16. And then it selects photo 16 and it said, you know, uh, click share sheet. And then, uh, it, you know, provided a list of numbers next to it. And so he said four, and that was like, send a message to his friend or something. And then, so it's just a way of controlling it visually through your voice. So kind of like, awesome. um, um, voiceover that's in the operating system but instead of reading it aloud it's visual cues and it looks really nice super great for sure like it might even be features i would want to enable while i'm feeling really lazy and just sitting up at my computer but don't feel like moving or i'm sitting like just far enough away that i want to like control something in itunes without um getting up totally like that's the critical thing about a lot of these features that are like quote-unquote accessibility features is that ultimately they just kind of make the system better to use for everybody. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Totally true. Uh, there are new text formatting tools in Mail. Uh, there's a new and improved Notes app. So you get things like Gallery View, Improved, sh- improved Search, and a Checklist option. Uh, more personalized Health app. Um, again, it's you know f- supporting a lot of the features in the new um, version of WatchOS. So things like cycle tracking, um, et cetera, and the hearing things. Uh, there's an improved start page in Safari. That was that was on their marketing site, so we're going to talk about it or mention it. Um, Just more ML assisted stuff, almost yeah. certainly. Recently viewed suggestions, things like that. Um, the files app um, has support for external drives and file servers. Mm-hmm. Uh, is this true in the iPhone as well as the iPad? I believe it has to be. Cool. I know the iPad Pros at least have a much higher. Um, powers or their usb port because well the ipad pros have usb c everything else has lightning yep. at least today um those ipad pros can drive a lot higher power through that port than an iphone so mm-hmm. yeah uh, you can now have font management on ios so That's i wonder if they're going to call this app like font book or something but it's probably <laughs> just like a, a framework that an application can pull in to choose a font so you can now install fonts through the mac app store or through wow the ios app store uh, you can do font stuff today using a uh, third-party app and installing profiles on your phone. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you have to sideload to do it or not, but there are ways to do it today. But this will be much more supported throughout the whole operating system. Totally. Something about handoff to iPad or to HomePod. So, like sharing a song that you're listening to on your phone. If you like, hold it up to your HomePod, it'll start playing there. Nice. Um, there are a bunch of new developer things. So you can do things like adding heat, weather, and buildings to uh, a map. Um, there's a portrait segmentation API for a uh, camera and the photos. Uh, there's some location API changes similar or in the same realm as the like allow location once. Mm-hmm. Um, sign in with Apple. There's more support for enterprise identity. I don't know if this is kind of using the sign in with Apple, but for an enterprise installation. Mm-hmm. Um, Core ML3, um, some more Siri things about like follow-up questions, shortcut customization, and audio content playback, mm-hmm. um, and then Siri reservation support. So things like if you're making a reservation, Siri can remind you to check in, provide directions and maps, um, add to calendar, etc. The calendar stuff is kind of nice because it's already like that's already pretty crucial in combination with uh, CarPlay um, because like. If I know I'm, you know, on my way to a meeting, um, when I plug in my phone for CarPlay, 
the Maps app pops right up and saying, hey, you want to go here? <laughs> and I can just tap a button and go. Um, that's so, awesome. That's, that's kind of improving. Is, is like It's already pretty great, so improving that is even better. Nice. Do you want to talk about ARKit 3? Yes, absolutely. So the most important thing that ARKit 3 offers uh, is uh, initial support for um, occlusion. Uh, so occlusion is this thing, if you've ever messed around with an AR app, uh, where like anything in the 3D world, anything that you're adding to the AR scene always looks like it's in the foreground. Um, so it always looks like it's directly on top of whatever else is in the camera view, which is kind of a bummer because a lot of times you want these things to look like they're kind of interspersed or at a certain distance. And so there are kind of ways you can hack it with shadows and stuff like that. But for the most part, um, you know, there's really only like one company that's doing anything, um, like, uh, even remotely interesting with regard to, um, how, how to handle that depth stuff. And it's called 6D AI, 6D.AI put a link in the show notes to it. Um, but Apple was kind of the first of the major AR framework providers to actually support partial occlusion. So this is, this is kind of the, um, this is kind of one of those things where, uh, Apple's framework allows you to say, say you have like an entire 3d world around you. So it's not just like you're putting an object out in the 3d world, but you have like a five meter square box that is your entire world. In the keynote demo, they used a little slice of the Minecraft world. And then as a human, you can kind of walk around that world. And then somebody, uh, somebody else who's holding the phone can kind of see how you interact with that world. And because humans are a relatively predictable shape, um, (laughs) they're probably, they're, what they're basically doing is they're throwing ML classifiers at the camera feed. And they're saying, Hey, Coramel, tell me where a person is in this picture. And wherever the person is in the picture, that's what they'll allow to be at a certain depth position. Because it's a much easier problem than saying, hey, take arbitrary objects and see and see if I can figure out where they are in this 3D world. Um, so my conclusion is that this is not sufficient occlusion. Um, taking people into account uh, when you're doing stuff like this is fine, but this is just really the simplest version or this, the simplest possible way to solve it. Not to discount what what a feat it is to get this to work because it is difficult, um, but if you are not an AR app developer like me, I doubt you'll find this compelling. Hmm. That sounds really interesting. I'm excited to see some demos and what you come up with, Brendan. Yeah, it'll be some fun stuff for sure. I used the... Um... That AR pl- uh, common file format for like a 3D object that you can embed in a website or something. I used that oh, for yeah, the first the... time today uh, looking at the size of a Mac Pro on my desk at work. <laughs> That's my awesome. It's pretty fun. The USDZ, yeah, it's good stuff. Yeah, exactly. um, There's no way to author those right now, which is kind of a bummer with outside of Xcode. Hmm. Bummer, yeah. Until now, but more on that later. Ooh, exciting. Um, and so to... To end with iOS, um, it'll support the iPhone SE or 6S and newer. So they're jumping two years up here for removing device support. So last year, um, iOS 12 supported the same devices as iOS 11. So that was the iPhone 5S and newer. And so, mm-hmm. um, you know, if they're following the standard of uh, removing support from that oldest iPhone every year, we're, we'd be on track still. But it hurts a little bit to have a two-year jump here. But mm-hmm. I'll say as uh, someone who owns an iPhone six that runs iOS 12, just, I just use it to play around with cause it's my old iPhone. It is so slow. Um, so that's probably for the best. Yeah. New this year, they uh, threw, well actually kind of leaked like an hour before the keynote ish yeah. that um, they're now calling the OS that runs on the iPad, iPad OS. So this is kind of a, th- a reverse throwback to when, uh, up until what became iOS or called iOS four, it was called iPhone OS. So I'm curious if iPhone OS will be coming back for the iPhone, and then they'll call this iPad OS. But we will see. And nothing other than iPhones and like the iPod Touch run iOS right now. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. yeah. So that it's called iOS is a little odd, but. Who knows? Maybe there will be some fun new projects, like an uh, like an iOS, like a fridge that runs iOS, right? 
<laughs> Gotta compete with that those fridges be... that run Android. Yeah, I, I suppose. Um, so yeah, we'll see what happens there. Um, so iPad OS 13 has all the same features as iOS, um, with the addition of some extra new features. So, um, these are largely around multitasking and kind of, you know, more pro level stuff. Um, so things like, uh, multiple apps in slide over. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, normally today in iOS 12, you have one app and then to get rid of it, you kind of like swipe it down and you can come in and you, or you can drag another app there in its place. Um, but now you can kind of enter, enter a multitasking mode and swipe through, similar to the multitasking switcher on an iPhone. Um, there's App Expose. So this is kind of like where you just see a high-level overview of all their apps you have open. Um, there's a new um, home screen that has pinned widgets. So those notification center widgets you can have on your home screen now. And then the home screen widgets can or app icons are a little more densely packed. Um, And you can have apps in multiple spaces. So this is kind of that holy grail of multiple instances of one app open at the same time that we've been kind of wanting for several years. And so like the classic example is, oh, I have two Word documents I have open and I want to like, you know, view them both at the same time. Well, Mm -hmm. if if Word is updated to support this, you can do that. Um, Up until today, only Safari has been an app that will support that. And so this means you can have multiple apps open at the same time as well as adding an app to multiple spaces. Um, so you're, you know, today in iOS 12, if you have Safari and Word in one space, you can't use either of those apps in another space. But now you can have like a Safari in Word, a Safari in Slack, a Safari in Twitter, etc. cetera. Um, there's a Apple Pencil tool palette for things like, you know, drawing and erasing and whatnot that developers can use. Um Full page markup. So if you take a screenshot or something, you can mark up that full full page or in full page view. Um, some of that might be supported on the iPhone. I'm not exactly sure. Mm-hmm. Um, there's something called Sidecar uh, with macOS Catalina, which is the name for the next version of macOS. And it's something that Brandon will talk about in a little bit. Um, there's um, now kind of system level gestures for copy, paste, and undo. So this is where you can take three fingers and expand to copy, pinch to paste, and swipe left to undo. Um, and they said there are a couple more, so I would assume redo might be there. I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. Um, cursor navigation. I typed that up. I don't remember typing that at all, But so I don't remember what that means. I don't know if that means mouse support or not. No idea. That's probably something I should look at. Um, oh, no, that's not mouse support. Okay, now I remember. This was in the text selection section. Um, so yep. this is um, about where if you're taking a cursor and you can kind of drag it around for like in a text field, you can drop that cursor um, more intelligently. Um, you can do multi-select. Uh, I forget how these all worked. That's probably something I could look at more. Um, but the one that I do remember is more intelligent text selection. So this is something where you can like double tap a word to select that word, double tap or triple tap to get the sentence and quadruple for a paragraph or mm-hmm. something along those realms. Um, yeah. Oh, select a word, double tap sentence with three whole paragraph with four um, cursor navigation is you can pick up and drag the cursor. So previously you had to put two fingers over the keyboard on an iPad or if you're on a phone, you can either 3D touch or hold on the space bar to move that cursor around. Mm-hmm. But now you can just pick up and drag on the iPad. Um, and multi-select is just you can quickly select a block of text by just dragging your finger over it versus having to hold down, let the thing pop up, drop a cursor, and then you drag it. So that's super handy. Um, you can now have a floating keyboard. So this is just like a detached iPhone keyboard with a little quick type row and whatever above, and you can just drag that around. So it's good for a little swiping if you're kind of holding it with one hand or, or, you know, you have a bunch of stuff and you just want to type with like your right thumb or something. Mm -hmm. Um, More keyboard shortcuts throughout, I think the operating system, at least Safari, that's what's in their screenshot and they call out in their little overview. Um, Files app got a bunch of stuff. It's um, kind of rewritten slash enhanced a ton. I see in the screenshot, there's a multi-column view, so it's got three columns, or four actually. So there's the browse section on the left, which th- has things like iCloud Drive on my iPad, Box, Dropbox, 
um, recently deleted, share, uh, shared, that's new, uh, tags. Um, and then you can, you know, select one of those. Then you'll see a, a list of folders. And then you can select a folder. And then you'll see a list of folders. And you can select a file or something. And you'll see a preview or metadata about that. So nice. multi-column. That's great because um, I know there are rumors about like a three-column layout on an iPad or at least for taking iOS applications and moving them onto the Mac because a three-column layout is common on the Mac, but it hasn't been on the iPhone or iOS yet. But I guess there's some sort of it in an iPad. Um, there's iCloud Drive folder sharing. Um, so you can share with someone else in iCloud. Um, you can load file servers. I'm not sure which types of file servers, but... Uh, I believe SMB and NFS were listed. I know SMB was, which is like, no, like there was like one lone cheer in the keynote for it, which is like, yeah, the SMB guy. Nice. Cool. Well, and Good SMB is, well, hmm, I would want SFTP probably, but that yeah. might, I don't know, we'll see. So, um, do you know who uh, honors... Borum, he writes um, Working Copy, which is the yeah. fantastic Git client for iOS. He's right now building an app that lets you load file servers in files as a files plugin. Um, That's awesome. So he was looking for beta testers about that like a month ago. Um, so I've been trying that out a little bit, but um, I, he kind of got Sherlocked. Though if he supports more file format or server formats, then maybe it's okay. Yeah. Um, and finally, external drives, which we mentioned are mentioned in the iOS section, but so things like an SD card reader and a USB drive. Um, this is something, you know, people have been asking for about iPads for nine years now. So right. I don't know if many people will actually use it, but there are definitely times where it's super handy and it it's the difference between being able to use an iPad and not. So I think totally. that's really powerful stuff. Um, and Safari has a download manager now. And so there's a downloads folder in files. And so you can see the progress of files as they're being downloaded. It's not going to occupy that your current tab is like a full screen thing. Um, and it's the full desktop version version of Safari. I don't really know what they have done to do this. Presumably the user agent at least um, I know there are a few features in Safari on the Mac versus the iPad that aren't there. Um, I know there, there are a couple of APIs that aren't there, so I wonder if they added support for that or if it's just things like you can download to a download. It doesn't have to take up the screen. Um, they have right. examples of using things like Google Docs, um, Squarespace, and WordPress in full desktop mode instead of their mobile views. That's pretty iconic, and that's something that I hope to test out here in the coming days. Um but, um, you know, it, it's just one of those things that, like, kind of heralds the iPad coming into its own, um, which I know I think at the last WWDC keynote or the when the uh, the current generation iPad Pros were announced back in October, um, yeah. I remember feeling like, all right, this this is, you know, we're kind of one or two generations away from being able to do the kind of work that we do on an iPad. And there are already classes like type of types of work that folks are able to do on an iPad. Like I'm thinking like, since I've gone freelance, um, I have just like blocks of time that I spend doing emails and like, just like coordinating stuff. And I feel like I could do most of that email work, um, on an iPad. And I feel like there's some, there's some types of work that I could get on an iPad too. But I think, um, you know, just like being able to be a little bit more mobile with some of the stuff or to mess with the stuff on the bus or on a plane, um, having the downloads manager, a more mature files view and even external drives like that's that's pretty great. That's a that's a pretty solid start. Yeah, I'm it's it's starting to become, you know, a full featured device. Um, I was as reading all these uh, notes. Um, so over the last like you know, of me using iOS, they've been adding yeah. features that I've experimented with when I jailbroke. So I've, I have used download managers on my iPhone as far back as probably iOS four. Um, I have taken my iPad and plugged in a USB hard drive to it and browsed and watched movies via a USB hard drive on my iPad. Um, 
Maybe it was iPhone at that point. So some of the stuff has been technically possible for a while. And I've kind of tried out crude versions of it that were just, you know, patched into it through jailbreaking. Yeah. But it's been really cool to see basically everything and way more being added. I don't think there's a single feature in um, iOS now that I um, am missing from jailbreaking after this this stuff gets added. With the um, one caveat of Last FM Scrabbling, which uh-huh. is super niche, but I've been using a third-party music app, which apparently is like totally a thing you can do. Um, I use uh, Mavis Pro. I think maybe I mentioned it on a podcast. I'm not sure. Yeah, you did mention it on a podcast because I remember I wanted to check it out. I haven't done it yet just because, um, you know, like CarPlay and stuff is so crucial for me. But yeah. um, but it looks really great. Well, um, I'll just quick say. Um, under the hood, the music app is still the default music player, so it's still using the it's like using the same framework under the hood. So, yeah. um, if you start playing a song with that app, I think CarPlay would work as if it was being played in the music app, just fine. Really, it just kind of huh. works. It's really slick because I can I can open a song in that app and then open the music app, and it's showing it like I had started playing it in the music app. Right on. That's awesome. So check it out. Um. Uh, dark mode is, of course, coming to the iPad as well. Um, yeah, so this is supported on the iPad Air 2 and newer, the iPad Mini 4 and newer, the iPad 5th Gen and newer, and the iPad Pro and newer. Nice. So, I don't know if they drop devices here or not. Probably the first iPad Air. Yeah. Maybe iPad Mini. I think iPad Mini 2 is actually supported on iOS 12. Really? Um, so they dropped. I mean, dropping those two generations of iPad Mini makes sense. Well, the iPad Mini the, three was the same chip as the iPad Mini two, but just with Touch ID. So, right. So they have to kind of they have to kind of leave behind that unfortunate time in the iPad Mini's life, um, where it kind of languished without updates for a little while. So that part makes sense. I'm glad to hear that the iPad Air two got an update. Um, but, um, which is the iPad that I have had until today. Um, but, uh, I upgraded to a iPad air, uh, an iPad pro this afternoon. Uh, and I've had like no time to mess with it, but I'm super excited to take better advantage of all these features. Um, because the air two is definitely starting to show its age a little bit. Um, so like sidecar, all of the files changes and Safari and stuff. I hope to have some more information about that shortly for subsequent pod kits. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll, I'll have it on my iPad pro 9.7 inch. Um, it's working well enough. It's running better than my iPad mini two was when I finally replaced that. Yeah, for sure. So I think I'm going to keep it around to at least the next iPad pro refresh. We'll see. Yeah. I uh, getcha. Well, now it's time. Uh, last but not least, talk about mac os yeah and remember i don't know anything about this other than a few things like it's called catalina there's a feature called sidecar that lets you like mirror an ipad and um marzipan probably baked out more i don't know and there's that new dynamic ui framework is that the same thing i don't even know let's hear it what's what's up let's get into it yes so mac os 10.15 is going to be called mac os catalina um, so it's named for an island in California that has a mountain on it and the mountain and the island share a name, I believe. Uh, and kind of the first thing before we get too far into it, that kind of got a lot of news was, um, uh, iTunes as we know it is going to be broken down into smaller apps. Um, so, uh, music podcasts and Apple TV functionality are now all in separate apps in Mac OS. Ooh, but nice. ultimately, this isn't this isn't like a terribly surprising change because that's how it's been on iOS for a number of years now. Since the beginning, I think. Actually, no. Since they broke up iPod app, which was right. iOS five, maybe. Yeah, so it's 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 been around for quite some time now, um, and as as a result, I think you know it just kind of represents. Um, you know, kind of an evolution in the way that we interact with the the stuff formerly known as iTunes. Uh, if you want to sync your iOS device to your laptop or to, to, to your computer, to your Mac, um, which as I describe this, uh, I'm realizing I haven't done this for years, years and years and years. Um, I 
it, it, I'm actually kind of surprised even to find myself saying this, but if you do find yourself needing to sync your iOS device uh, over a lightning cable with your Mac, uh, you can actually do that in Finder now, which is nice and fun. Nice. I, I did see a tweet from... Uh, he's the developer of PCalc. Uh, oh, yeah. What's his name? Oh, my God. Um, I'm blanking. I totally know it. Anyway, uh, he was saying that Carbon or uh, Finder and uh, James Thompson, that's what it is, iTunes and Finder were both written in Carbon at one day, so they share some roots, so it makes sense that they come together now. He's there saying in a go. joking way. Um, <laughs> I do use fi- uh, iOS syncing occasionally, but that's to exclusively copy audiobooks from my Mac and just like MP3 files to my phone. Um, they don't get added to an iCloud media library if they are tagged mm-hmm. as type audiobook and or if they're you know too large of a file so sometimes audiobooks are like eight hour files which are like huge so um yeah that's why i would use device syncing personally gotcha that makes a lot of sense i'm i'm usually not that complex with uh the way that i share that stuff uh so i'm i'm probably a little bit of an odd case for that uh, but interestingly, uh, some of these are uh, implied uh, Marzipan apps, or as it's now called, not Marzipan, but Project Catalyst. Hmm. Um, yeah, which kind of makes sense because, you know, Catalyst is like you take a metal, you throw a catalyst in, in there, and, um, and I don't know, some sort of... No, no, no. A solution and a solvent and a catalyst, and then something drops out and it's Particip- uh, precipitate i failed chemistry a catalyst uh <laughs> makes a reaction happen faster yeah 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 exactly exactly um so it's like you throw you throw in some ios code in there with project catalyst and out pops a mac app nice and fun uh and i believe the the podcasts and apple tv apps uh were officially catalyst apps i'm not sure about music but it's very possible that's the case too so I heard before today that the, the the new music app, which had kind of rumored out, and there was a screenshot that, that even leaked, is actually just iTunes, but they've removed more features from iTunes. So it's another gotcha. reskinning of iTunes. But I could be wrong. We will hear about it this week. It did kind of look like the music app was the least marzipani of of the app. So I would not be surprised that that's if if music was literally just iTunes with the reduced feature sets. Yeah, and um, the music but, app on the iPad is is not great to say the least, and so I I would expect that if they make a uh, Project Catalyst version of the music app, they would also run it on the iPad to improve the experience there. Absolutely. When I upgrade this iPad to the beta version of iOS, I will report back on what I find because I agree with you. It's it's probably one of the worst first party apps on the iPad. Um. But reminders, notes, and uh, calendar, I believe, are all are also Project Catalyst apps. Wow, um, they're my, they're porting over tons of stuff. Yeah, so all of the same goodness that you expect uh, or heard about in the iOS section around like reminders, using machine learning to remind you better, or guess which of your fifty thousand reminders are are most salient. Um, or to do all that fun stuff with calendar events and appointment reminders, um, that all applies as well because MLKit is available across platform. And if these are Project Catalyst apps, as they seem to be, um, they probably can run essentially without modification. The interesting thing I found about Catalyst apps that I hadn't heard before is it sounds like um, part of the thing is that they need to be ready for the iPad in order for them to be translated properly into uh, mac os apps um which i'm presuming is some sort of auto layout quirk like like the point is in order for them to become mac os apps they have to support like the auto layout form factor of an of an ipad which is like um like large large thin or something like that it's it's like like tall uh it's, it's like short wide or something like that um I'm trying to remember what the auto layout terms for it are, but basically like it makes sense that it would kind of need to follow the iPad form factor because otherwise the auto layout constraints, like the app might not be built for that kind of auto layout constraint. And then you'd have some weird situation where your app looks like it's running on an iPhone, which 
is not really desired on a on a Mac OS device. Yeah. Um, but you know, people were commenting, and I noticed certainly that there was just kind of a little bit more polish uh, with the uh, Catalyst apps this time around. Um, so it's it's kind of exciting to see how that's matured over time. Uh, and part of that might have to do with some of the other stuff that's going on, uh, which we'll talk about right now because I'm uh, editing the show notes as we go. Um, Wonderful. So right, right along that time uh, that Apple was kind of discussing Project Catalyst, they mentioned a really cool new uh, UI framework. And they spoke about this in a really interesting way as kind of like a, a swift first way to write UIs for the Mac and for iOS and for watch OS. Um, I guess iOS and iPad OS, uh, gotta, gotta bring the whole family in. Uh, <laughs> and it's called Swift UI. Uh, and this kind of sort of supplants like app kit and UI kit in the sense that, um, the primitives that you're using are, are a little bit different from what you would use if you were, if you were writing a traditional, uh, like UI kit app. Um, and when you look at the code, I found it strikingly similar to the way that you instantiate or create UIs in React Native or in Flutter. I would say optically, uh, it looks most like Flutter, um, just because of the way that you're constructing the views as almost like trees. So, uh, Brian, I know you've built React apps, um, and I think like one of the things that you'll note as you look at the sample code for this stuff uh, is that um, it kind of looks like JSX without the angle brackets, right? You have like a view and you have like a text node and you have like an image node and all that stuff. Yeah, their their tagline is uh, de- declare the user interface and behavior for your app on every pl- platform. That sounds just like React, which is super declarative um, JavaScript UI framework. Um, so is this, the idea here is that you write your UI in one language that works on all platforms. And I, yep. I, I have to think that under the hood, it's, you know, compiling down to more optimized things for each system in a way that, um, marzipan that it exists in, um, Mac OS Mojave was really just running UI kit in a, in a wrapper on the Mac. I'm curious how Project Catalyst, if they're um, doing more of the Swift UI stuff, or if this is really just the next evolution in the future. Yeah, based on the way they described it in the keynote, I'm under the impression that this is an entirely new ground up framework. Um, okay. But I'm kind of in agreement with you that the way that there, there's got to be some overlap here. Um, because, you know, while Catalyst is kind of like, input an iOS app, output a Mac OS app. Um, this is kind of a new way of writing those interfaces from scratch. Um, and I, I feel like it kind of has more to do with Swift as a, like the use of Swift as a language, like the first UI framework that has Swift kind of in mind, um, rather than, you know, kind of app kit and UI kit that were, that were kind of built for the objective C days. Um, but I'm not, I'm not 100 percent sure, and I'm I'm really excited to dig deep deeply into this because for the most part, um, you know, with a little bit of investment, this would supplant most of what I do for kind of small time apps uh, with React Native and uh, with Flutter, uh, and I'd get to use a tool chain that I know and love uh, rather than learning a new one or messing with a new one that can be kind of unpleasant. Yeah, it seems like it's a more modern way to write an interface as well. Uh, just purely going off the declarative part of it. Um, yeah, for sure. Now, I don't know, UIKit and AppKit might be a little more declarative than something like what I'm used to as non-declarative ones like AngularJS. But it's totally. completely different realms, so I don't really know. I'm really interested to see how this is. This is super cool. Uh, I'd like to play around with it maybe once it becomes a little more stable so I don't you know, I can find help and things online, but this is, this is awesome. This is super exciting. Yeah. I'm going to try to dive head first into it tonight and, uh, and see kind of what, what comes out of it. But the first thing is, I feel like this is going to open up, uh, a lot of native Mac, de- uh, Mac and iOS development to, uh, folks like you and I who work kind of in the react realm, at least in part. 
yeah, that could be them too, you know, yeah, combating a explosion in, yeah, UI development for the browser, and they want to make it more easy for that to be pulled into more native applications on the Mac. Um, I wonder if this will, you know, they're just trying to encourage saying, hey, Project Catalyst is a thing, but yep. if you can, use Swift UI because the experience might be better. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think... If you're trying to build a Mac app or an iOS app today, you have a lot of different options for how to do it more than ever before. And, um, you know, I, I would say that for the most part, if you can, if you have the time and uh, and tools to build a native app using something like React Native or Flutter or Swift UI or even straight up Swift and AppKit or, or UIKit, um, you're almost always going to create a better experience than if you were to use just like a web app in Safari, uh, even in mobile Safari. So Electron could use, or Electron developers. So the thing is, this doesn't obviously work for other platforms. So, Yep. But for the most part, I, I, that doesn't matter at all to me. <laughs> because I'm, I'm, I, I, I ebb and flow a little bit, but for the most part, um, I'm iPhone, iPad, MacBook Pro all the way. Uh, yep. Speaking of going all in, uh, I'm also really excited about Sidecar. Uh, I know you mentioned this as an iPad OS feature. Um, and one of the things that's really cool about Sidecar... I don't think I ever s- said what it is. So you want to start with oh, that? Oh, yeah. Perfect. Perfect. So Sidecar is cool because it's a way that allows you to use your iPad as an external display for your Mac. You can actually do this wirelessly, um, but for Apple also kind of recommends that you plug it, plug your iPad in so that it can remain charged because unsurprisingly driving that display can take a lot of battery power. Um, there've been some products that have done this in the past. There's something called Luna. Um, that is like a USB, uh, stick that you plug into your Mac, uh, to, to run that, um, so that it can do that external display syncing. And then I've also used a uh, duet display, which I believe has a bunch of like ex Apple engineers, um, on staff, um, that would do it, uh, that would do that same thing, but you just have to connect, um, your Mac to your iPad with a, with a cable, with a lightning cable. Um, and it's kind of a bummer for both of those crews because they've been doing a lot of work, uh, good work for this. Um, but as a consumer, I'm really excited that Apple has, is kind of making this happen. Um, actually it's kind of a big reason why I picked the size of iPad I did, um, uh, yeah, because, yeah. uh, essentially a 13 inch iPad will make essentially a, a second laptop screen, uh, worth of, worth of display. There are lots of other cool features with this too. Like if you have an Apple pencil, uh, and a compatible iPad that can use the Apple pencil, of course, uh, you can actually use your iPad almost like a pen tablet, um, which, you know, with the precision that the, that Apple's able to get out of the iPad pencil, it's actually a really awesome uh, idea to kind of use it to replace like the Wacom tablets that designers have, um, because like a compa- like a similar one of those would easily run you like three to four k uh, if 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 you're not looking, um, and just like having the ability to access that now at the price range of an iPad is uh, it's pretty neat. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, of another thing of particular interest to me is uh, Apple's augmented reality authoring app. They're calling it Reality Composer. Uh, and a neat thing about Reality Composer, it, it kind of looks not dissimilar from like uh, Unity or Snapchat Lens Studio uh, or like a simplified version of all these things or like Maya. Um, yeah, yeah. But the cool thing about it is that it kind of, uh, it comes with a compatible iOS app that allows you to kind of, make changes in reality composer and view them live, uh, on device. And I feel like this is going to be, uh, a great tool for folks to learn or just get their feet wet in 3d. Uh, and 3d modeling is one of the most difficult things that I do day to day. Uh, so I, I think that's definitely a cool thing, uh, that Apple's making it available for folks for sure. Nice. Next up is uh, screen time for the Mac, and I'm going to devote as little time as possible to this because I despise screen time as a feature. <laughs> I can totally understand that it's like useful to people, but um, you know, ultimately, especially on the Mac, it doesn't really help me to know that I'm working a lot 
for example, like if, if it's saying, you know, uh, like the, the marketing pages for this call things like, oh, you know, you can trace, uh, you know, how much time you spend in communication apps. And it's like, I don't want this. And it's like, you can, you can look at how much time you're spending on apps, uh, related to work versus, you know, um, you know, stuff related to like entertainment or things like that. And it's like, again, don't want to know. <laughs> None of this information is pertinent to me and it's all very bad. So we can just skip right past that. Um, some more kind of stuff that's, I think a little bit more interesting is about like kind of the internals of Mac OS Catalina. Um, there's a note that Catalina will run on a read only system volume, um, which I think has been the case to some degree for a long time. Uh, which is to say that like Mac OS is usually run on a separate partition or at least always had a separate read only partition used for recovery purposes. So um, it, yeah, I, it has, it's always had a recovery partition, but that wasn't ever used when you ran the operating system normally. Right. Um, I think they talked about this on ATP last week. I think. Yeah. Um, and so this would be, you know, you know, slash system would be a, mounted as a separate partition into there. And then, yeah, read only. I think today it's protected through uh, system integrity protection, you know, SIP, yeah. which was introduced two years ago. And um, just at the operating system level, it's more, it's simpler to implement and it's just more straightforward. And it's, you know, the old school way, but it's tried and true. Um, and it's probably a little safer because then you can't, you, you know, you can't get around how you mount a file system really, unless you mark it as, read write and then you remount it yeah but that's like that's the single vector of attack so it's probably a lot hard or easier to harden something like that yeah for sure for sure and i guess like that's kind of the the thing that immediately kind of concerned me about this is like well when you do an upgrade does that make your upgrades more brittle because what if what if something messes up at that point that's like a critical point of failure it feels like but that's what your recovery partition is for so maybe that's okay yeah. um but you know, still kind of a bummer. They'll have um, to. They'll definitely have to move some things out of there, probably. Um, right. There, you know, there are a lot of like the system library core services. There's a lot of apps in there. That's for like totally. screen sharing lives and you know audio MIDI explorer or whatever it's called. Yeah, think things like that are still live in system, and so some of that might need to be pulled out a little bit or or at least changed. I know there's system library extensions is where yep. you put kernel extensions. Um, there is also library extensions where they've kind of encouraged people to put them for a while, but both have been supported. I'm curious how this will impact Hackintoshing as well. Totally. Um, so a lot of Hackintoshing, the the modern way, quote unquote, is to inject kernel extensions at boot. Um, I would imagine that could still work, but um, the old way is to just drop it in system library extensions, but that clearly won't work anymore. Right. Or you just say, screw it, mount it as read, write, and override the default. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that'd do it. Um, but you mentioned kernel extensions. Uh, another thing I was reading about was DriverKit that um, kind of wraps the way that kernel extensions can be uh, initialized and run. Uh, it's supposed to provide a little bit more protection against that. But kind of like you said, I feel like some of the stuff that's kind of uh, definitely has security implications, like positive security implications, also kind of makes it harder to build a Hackintosh. And I think like the combination of the driver kit stuff and um, maybe some of this T2 security chip stuff that Apple's been talking up, uh, it might make it harder, if not really, really, really nearly impossible to do a Hackintosh in just a couple of years, which is kind of a bummer because Hackintoshing is really great. Um, and like a really valuable way to learn a lot of things, I feel like. Oh my um, god, I learned so much doing that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think um, you know it's kind of you, you look back at jailbreak and the golden years were definitely you know the first you know I would say probably iOS like three four were more golden years up or really up until the end of iOS four um, yeah. where you had untethered jailbreaks. Um, iOS three was the last version you could do like or no iOS. 4 Four, the iPhone four was the last phone you could have like a custom boot logo, for example. Um, yeah. It started to get more and more because there were hardware bugs that they exploited in those days, and now it's all yep. software user land. And now you basically to jailbreak, you have like demons running that like continuously check and 
modify code at runtime to keep the jailbreak active and things. And that's like, that's not great. And so I wonder if Hackintoshing is eventually going to kind of get to that point where to keep it going, you need to have something running while you're, you know, not just like a kernel extension you have installed, but like some process or active thing to combat the operating system. Or you just right. like disable so much security that is it really worth it? <laughs> yeah, it functionally becomes Windows XP and yeah, no. <laughs> oh no. Oh, gross. Uh, anyhow, there is some other kind of cool security stuff going on. Uh, activation lock for Mac OS is going to be introduced in Catalina. Um, so once you log in with your Apple ID, uh, it can only be uh, quote unquote activated again with that same Apple ID. Um, activation is kind of a weird phrase for here because usually that's used in the context of like a cell phone activation. Um, but the point being like, once your MacBook is deemed like lost, um, the only way to let that, uh, to reactivate it is using, uh, that original Apple ID, which is kind of a positive thing. I feel like my guess is that will only be for Macs that have the T2 because, Uh, the T2 handles disk encryption, which is how the iOS devices are activated, activated, activation locked. Um, so I'm assuming they're just kind of hopping onto that. Absolutely. Probably part of that would also be for, uh, you know, this approve with Apple Watch feature where uh, you can kind of use your Apple Watch as like a pseudo key, uh, S-U-D-O, mm. pseudo. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So like... Uh, Kind of like for Macs with a with a Touch ID sensor, uh, you can log into one password or act, authenticate other system actions with Touch ID. Um, approve with Apple Watch will kind of allow you to do the same thing with your watch, which is kind of cool. So I remember when um, uh, Touch ID first came to the Mac, um, yep. I saw someone wrote a PAM, which I think is yep. pure authentication... Pluggable. Pluggable authentication module, yeah, which yep. is like a low-level Unix thing for the authentication system, and so it was a it was a way that you could use Touch ID when with a pseudo command. So this is kind of like that, but through the Apple Watch at, a, at an actual approved system level. It's pretty slick, for sure. Yep, that's exactly what it's all about. Awesome, that's great. Sweet, um, and voice control, which you already described, is also available on the Mac. That's that uh, accessibility tool that allows you to kind of uh, work with basically all all aspects of your uh, of your Mac uh, just by giving it voice commands. Um, so check out that video in the show notes if you want a refresher on what that ref- refers to. Uh, there are also third party file providers supported in Finder, just like iOS. Uh, so that's kind of that same sort of presumably things like Dropbox uh, or even possibly things like S3. Uh, available and kind of readable in there over time. Uh, there's also a uh, mention of a uh, replacement for like Find My Mac. Uh, so that's that Find My app that'll replace Find My Mac, Find My iPhone, Find My Friends. Um, that'll allow you to see where all your Apple devices are. Um, and an interesting thing too is that there's a notion of like, uh, for example, if, if you lose your MacBook, uh, your MacBook doesn't have a cellular connection. So you can't actually, you, you don't really have any luck. Uh, you're you're kind of out of luck if you lose your Mac and it's not connected to a network ever again. It's kind of off the grid. Um, however, uh, in part with activation lock, but also the Apple kind of mentioned this like uh, mesh network effect of like Apple devices being able to piggyback on other Apple devices to help report location uh information about where where things are so if your mac gets lost and it interacts with another apple device that does know its location it can kind of piggyback that all the way back to apple servers and tell you where where it's updated so that's kind of a cool thing that's awesome yeah i remember hearing a rumor about that a couple weeks ago yeah yeah because those are two systems that conceptually are like really similar but they're completely built independently away from each other so is that is that app going to be on ios and ipad os as well yep uh yep uh it'll supplant the separate find my iphone and find my mac or sorry find my iphone and find my friends apps okay great yeah sweet that's awesome that's some cool stuff in the mac that i definitely just learned right now so thanks so good so good yeah 
So was this a good a good WWDC? You think? I think so. I'm pretty excited about pretty much everything that came across. Uh, even the thousand dollar monitor stand. Uh, I'm just excited that Apple's kind of thinking on that level again. Yeah, providing options, that's for sure. I think they probably also have their margins way higher on that and thus the cost even higher because uh, I'm I'm guessing not that many people will buy it and so they need to make more to justify all the research and development that went into it. Absolutely. But that's what you get for a niche pro, really nice product. Truly indeed. Yeah, I would agree with you. This seems like really solid upgrades. Lots of exciting development changes that I'm really um, looking forward to seeing how that um, affects the applications that we use and the developers I follow on Twitter. Truly indeed. It'll be good stuff. So where can you find you, Brandon? Uh, You can find me just about everywhere, but particularly on the Nexus.tv where I uh, run a podcast with you and Ryan Rampers ad called Podcamp where we talk about things just like this. Uh, but if you want to find me elsewhere on the internet, uh, you can find me at the username Brandon underscore MN, wherever fine internet products are sold, mostly Twitter. Uh, and if you want to find me IRL, I'll probably be at a coffee shop in Minneapolis because I drink a lot of coffee. I got to let you know, I was at Quixotic this last weekend. Now that is in St. Oh, Paul. What? But, oh man, it's a great coffee shop. If you're in St. Paul, in Highland Park. Yeah. I'm a pretty big fan. I haven't been there in ooh, probably years, but uh, that's, that's one of my favorites. Uh, so where can we find you out of Quixotic? Uh, you can find me drinking a vanilla cold brew from Quixotic. Uh, but otherwise, you can find me on Twitter at Brian Mitch L or my website, brianm.me. Um, as Brandon said, I'm also a co-host of PodKit, which is web development and Apple news and things. So kind of like this, but with more web development, usually. Yeah, and that's at thenexus.tv slash... Uh, I don't even know. Nexus.tv. Yeah, we'll f- find a podcast there. You can find show notes for this episode at thenexus.tv slash NS65. We released this episode with a Creative Commons license as well, so you can remix and reuse this and share it around. Um, just give attribution back to our website um, and our podcast. Um, you can talk about this episode on our subreddit, which is reddit.com slash r slash thenexustv. And if you like what we're doing here at the network, um, you can hit us up on Patreon, which is patreon.com slash the Nexus TV. Uh, and with that, happy WWDC 19. Woo. Can't wait until the next one. One year away. Oh, man. It'll be great. Maybe we'll actually attend that one. That'll be cool. Goals. Truly. All right. Well, have a good one. Have a good one. The Nexus, the Nexus, the Nexus TV podcasts from, from the, the technological, technological convergence. convergence.